All right, guys. So let's just briefly uh, go over the lecture notes. By the way, uh, do you know where to find them? Yes, I mean, everybody knows where to find those lectures and you can read them. And you ask me, where do you find the material? You have plenty of things that you can read. So this uh, lecture was a bit confusing to some people. So let me try to mention a few things again. Okay, guys, so you see my, the way I imagine this problem, right? We have this five toilet paper rolls and uh, the six shoppers and uh, those items are, there's no difference between one item and another. Uh, and uh, so the way I imagine the situation playing out is that you see, how do you know how to partition the five toilet paper rolls among six individuals? So I imagine that those individuals are, you know, at the cashiers, if you've seen the cashiers and you have this thing that I call the trade meal, but maybe a better way is conveyor belt. Maybe trade meal confuses you, right? But the conveyor belt. And this is the security camera recording what happened above. Can you picture that? Can you imagine you're watching it through a security camera and you are seeing those items? Now, how many items are you seeing? You are seeing the toilet paper rolls and you are seeing the, the parts parts that, that, and you are seeing the bars that separate the toilet paper rolls. They separate the items of one shopper from those of another shopper. Can you imagine that, guys? Yes, you can. I'm sure you can. And uh, why do I pick those objects? Well, for many reasons, but uh, one of them is look at it. Toilet paper rolls from above, they look like zeros and separating bars from above look like ones. Do you agree? Now, if I see uh, one bar, that means I have a partition into two parts. If I see two bars, I have partition into three bars. Do you agree? Can you see that guys? All of you. There was even one uh, person uh, that received a weekend torture uh, about it, right, specifically. So, you are with me, yes, guys? Very good. So you see those items. And uh, uh, those items then look at this, this becomes now, now when you scan it, when you look at it from above, you can suddenly imagine that those items transform into a barcode, right? Barcode of a bunch of zeros and ones. So then what you're, uh, what you're technically seeing here is uh, zero, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, one. That's the barcode. Right? How many digits are in this barcode? Well, it's the number of bars plus the number of toilet paper rolls. Now, how many bars do we need? If we have six shoppers, we need one less bar than the number of shoppers. Do you agree? We need five bars. Can you see that guys? Why five bars? Because one bar means two shoppers. Two bars means three shoppers. Everyone sees that? Beautiful, right? Not hard at all. Once you see that uh, in coding, not hard at all. One big problem is of course, how do you come up with codes? Like when you see a problem, how do you figure out what code you might like to use? So this now tells you exactly what happened, you see? Because what you're looking for are spaces between the ones, right? If there is no space between uh, uh, two ones, that person, uh, mean, it means that that person did not receive anything. Right, as you can see over here, right? So the space that there are two, bar, there are two toilet paper rolls, two zeros before the first one, that means that individual number one received two toilet paper rolls. Good. Now, X2, that's the second individual. There is no, there is basically nothing in between the next ones. That means he received zero, right? X3 now received three items. Do you now see what happened here, guys? Very simple, right? So each barcode uniquely identifies uh, a particular distribution of the items among the shoppers. Those are identical items because here we don't care who receives which particular toilet paper roll. Good. 
Everything clear, guys? So then yeah. all you have to do is, uh, is just count the number of total spaces. How many spaces is just how many digits do we have here? The number of digits in this case is the number of items. The number of items in general is N. Plus, if we partition it among M shoppers, the number of bars is M minus one. Do you see that? You see where N plus M minus one comes from? M minus one are the ones, are the bars. N are the items to be distributed. And then you can decide, choose what? Choose either, you can choose N. In other words, choose which spaces are occupied by toilet paper rolls, right? Because as soon as you choose which spaces are occupied by toilet paper rolls, as soon as you choose where you have the zeros, you right away know where you have the ones. So that means uh, decide which places are occupied by zeros. And that's going to be the same as N plus M minus one, choose M minus one. And that is here choosing the ones, choosing the places where one will occur. Do you understand? So here what I'm doing, I'm just counting the number of possible codes. Uh, or you can do it like some people prefer. You can imagine that uh, this is, you can imagine for a moment that all the items are distinct. And then you have, uh, in this case, uh, N plus M minus one factorial. Those are the number of words. So each letter is now unique, but that's not true, right? So we need to, we, we overcounted here. So then we divide by the uh, number of synonyms that we have here, which would be, uh, which would be N factorial and uh, well, M minus one factorial. And this is M. Okay. So although the formulas you're saying, well, I'm just writing the same thing, the algebra obviously looks the same, but the idea is not, do you understand? So you are not just trying to communicate the algebra, you're trying to think combinatorially, like you have a different counting method. So this is one counting method. Here I'm selecting the spaces occupied by the zeros. Uh, this is selecting the spaces occupied by ones, and this is treating each particular input as unique. And then uh, we have overcounting, and then we reduce the number of overcounting. You understand? So, I mean, I know it's a bit hard for, uh, for some. Uh, the idea is very simple really, right? So another analogy we had here is this, if you have a millipede, a millipede has 100 legs. Yes, now if you see 500 legs, how many millipedes do you have? You right away know the answer, yes? You right away know the answer is five. Now, why is it the answer five guys? Because when you count 500 legs, you know that, uh, uh, that you counted each millipede exactly 100 times. You understand? So my other analogy, and not everybody likes it, is that, as you see, is when, when, when my code is not unique, then I imagine uh, typing the code on a separate piece of paper and creating a stock, right? Creating a stock of papers, right? So the denominator n factorial m minus one factorial is how many papers I have in my column, in my stock. And each code on, the, on each paper is different, but refers to the same exact situation, right? So in this analogy, uh, the number of papers in the, in the particular column is the number of legs that a centipede has. I hope it helps you. Make sense? So you understand why we divide guys, yes? We understand when we divide and why, I hope you do. That's very important. Let me know if you have any questions and then I, or if not, then I will be moving on. Arkady, can you explain the division again? Oh uh, yes, thank you. Uh, let me try to explain the division again. And uh, this, is, this is the idea, right? So <clears throat> let me actually perhaps better pick uh, a different uh, board. I'll just go back to the other lecture. Division is, is very, very important guys. Okay, so I, I went uh, in uh, with this example. That was my initial example, one where it's easy to do it without overcounting and you can still see how the overcounting works in principle. Good, so in this uh, situation, I can only distinguish uh, the pawns that uh, look 
no, that, that have different colors. So I can distinguish the pattern white, white, black from the pattern uh, black, white, white, right? But I cannot, if I switch between uh, two white pawns, I do not get a different pattern. Fiona, do you see what I'm saying so far? Yes, I see. Okay, good. Uh, so those are the only distinguishable patterns. There are only three actually. You can see because uh, they are completely determined by the position of the black pawn. Either it's in the third place or it is in the second place or it's in the first place. Yes? So there are only three possibilities, right? Because uh, those are the only, uh, the only words that I can produce that are different, right? So uh, how do I do it using overcounting? With overcounting, I actually imagine that the pawns are distinguishable. And that's easy to do because you can imagine they have a serial number. So one pawn has the serial number one, the second is two, and the third is three. Good. And then I have, I, I record this information. I write, uh, I write on a document, I have uh, three boxes, I write uh, the order in which those pawns appear. So one, two, three means that I see this pattern, right? But uh, one, two, three, Look at it, one, two, three, and the code two, one, three, they look the same to me. They look like white, white, black. Do you see that? Because uh, one, two, three is this pattern. Uh, two, one, three, I just swapped between one and two. Do you see that, Fiona? Yes, I see it. Okay, good. So then we, we so th then basically we have two, those are different looking codes. You see one, two, three is a different code from two, one, three, yet they refer to the same reality. Right? This, is a, this is an example with low counting, but everything else works the same. Now, every other reality has exactly two possible words. I call them words. You see, one, three, two, or two, three, one, three, one, two, uh, three, two, one. So what, what, what is uh, one, three, two refers to? It refers to the black pawn being in the middle, All right? Both of them. So then what I do is I stack those documents together because they represent one reality. And then I need to just know how many columns I have because each column represents a reality, right? Each column contains words that identify the same reality. And the, and the thing is here is that each column of each reality is exactly the same height. Another way to say is that each millipede has the same number of legs. Now, if you understand my analogy of the millipede guys, in this case, the millipede has how many legs? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, legs? but I know they have a lot of legs. <laughs> no, but uh, you're thinking about the millipede. When you say millipede, you're saying 100 legs or something. I'm saying in this particular case, uh, how many legs uh, does our millipede have? No, Sarah? No, Jack? No. Guys, so we need to go back to the basics. You see, you, you were, I'm not sure what you were doing when you were children. I was counting millipede legs, right? That's what I was doing. That's why I'm so good at it. Okay, so how many legs? Do you understand that one reality is one creature? Well, yes, of course. What else could it be, right? Now, the millipede is that one reality. It consists of, uh, of the left and right leg. You understand it has two legs. So when I count the number of documents, how many documents I have is three factorial. Do you see that? Because three possibilities to fill in the first box, two possibilities for the next box and one possibility for the last box, I have three factorial documents, right? So three factorial documents means uh, six words, if you like to call them, you can decide their words, right? And each meaning has two synonyms or it, if you call meaning as a millipede, then each millipede has two legs. Each person has two legs. Maybe we have to play that blood, what when we're game after all, right? I mean, uh, we're not counting, we, we don't understand how to count legs apparently. So uh, each reality has in this case, uh, two words representing it or each individual, the individual is the column has two legs. Good, because each of them has two legs. Uh, when I count all the legs, I over count each individual by two. That's why I divide, divide by two. You understand? If each individual had seven legs, I am over counting. When I count all the legs, I'm over counting by seven. And I have to divide, uh, divide by seven. Do you understand guys? So you, pr you can use whichever analogy you prefer. They should be the same to you. Millipedes with legs or um, different words representing the same meaning. So what you do is you take all the 
uh, synonyms, you stack them one on top of another, and the column of those synonyms represents one meaning. But when you count all those words, when, whenever you count one of the synonyms, you're counting that word again. You're counting, so you're counting the meaning again, yes? So when you're counting through all the words, you have counted through the meaning exactly the, the, the number of times you uh, went through the synonyms. You follow me, guys? Yes, right? I'm, I, I, I sometimes have this tendency for melapropism, but I hope it's not confusing you tremendously, right? Words, synonyms, they represent the same meaning. If I count all the words, I sometimes uh, count the meaning several times because if, if I count, let's say in this case, one, two, three, or two, one, three, I counted the same meaning twice. I counted different words, but I counted the same meaning twice. Do you understand that? That's what I'm doing. That's pretty much the way I divide. If, if the number of uh, synonyms is disbalanced, it's not the same for each meaning, then uh, that will not work. You see, I cannot just divide all of them because then I have counted the different meanings uh, a different number of times. One meaning I might have counted once, another seven times, another two times, right? That's why it's much harder to count the number of meanings uh, of nouns in the English language because there are maybe some nouns that mean essentially the same thing and many of them, right? And then for other meanings, for other ideas, there are fewer words, right? So the Eskimos might have seven words for snow. So I heard, I do not know how many snow, uh, words for snow can you think of in English, right? So that's the, that's the point, right? So uh, you might have a disproportionate number of words representing the same thing. All right, good. I hope it was somewhat clear. Let's go and continue with, uh, with the probability. By the way, guys, uh, just uh, out of curiosity, have you been opening the lecture notes and, the, and trying to solve problems or not yet? Yes, all right. Well, if you prefer a textbook, fine, you can do it from the textbook, all the same. All right, so let's be going through um, through the review. All right, guys, so we solved a few of those. I, I hope you understood the idea there. We can go over them uh, later on. And we stopped with uh, this problem. I'm not sure if you thought about it, right? I thought to email you about it, but then I kind of forgot. Uh, so 52 cards divided into four piles that are not necessarily of equal size. Well, I mean, uh, I haven't created one, uh, right? Any WhatsApp or Discord uh, groups. So, Back to this uh, idea, guys. 52 cards divided into four piles. The piles are not necessarily of equal size. How many partitions are possible? Did anyone uh, think of it or you forgot? I'm gonna go through the answer since uh, otherwise it's not going to work. Exactly, right? Well, I'll tell you how I solved it and maybe you can come up with a better solution, right? I was only able to create a recursive formula. I was not able to come out with um, just a clean calculation type of thing, you see? So the recursive formula, you can make uh, a machine do it or you can follow it yourself and it would work. But uh, it, it is not like a number multiplied by another number divided by a number, right? It's not of that sort. So here is what I thought. Okay, guys, so this can be a bit uh, challenging here. So here is how I considered solving it, okay? Um, so here is what I decided to do before I consider cards. So I have, I have uh, N objects. Let's suppose I, instead of just 52 cards, I just consider arbitrarily having, having N different objects and I want to create K piles. Make sense? So let's say maybe this, this formula should work for any number of objects and any number of piles. Good. So, so far the notation, I hope it's clear. 
So then some, I, some parts are obvious, right? So I know, for instance, that if I have N objects and uh, I want to create N piles, there is only one way to do that. You understand here, we don't care how the piles are presented, only which, uh, you know, only among themselves, what is the pile contained? Can you see that? So if there, if there are N objects and N piles, then the answer is obviously one because I have to put uh, one pile consists of a single card, a single object. Good. Next, it's also very easy to figure out uh, what, what to do if I have uh, N objects, but I want to create only one pile. The answer is also one. And then I create this uh, formula also uh, out of the idea that if the number of piles is more than the number of objects, then obviously I cannot do it. So that will be zero. Yes, zero possibility, zero number of, of uh, distributions, partitions, when the number of piles is just bigger than the number of objects. So then I focus on the nth object, you see, to, to figure out where it's located on the nth object. So they're listed, you know, card one, all the way to card 52. So I focus on the last object to create the recursion. So my formula that I obtain is, is looking like this. N sub K of N is equal to N sub K minus one of N minus one plus K times N sub K N minus one. And how did I come up with this formula? Very simply guys, okay? So the idea is this. Um, suppose that, uh, that I just pay attention to the last card. Either the last card is alone or it's not alone. Do you agree? The 52 card, either it's alone or not. The nth card, either alone or not alone. Can you see that? If the card is alone, I just have to consider distributing the remaining objects among K minus one piles, right? I have the, the remaining objects are among K minus one piles and uh, whatever that number is, if I could figure it out, that's the number of uh, situations in which the, um, the last card is by itself, right? Plus, I need to know the situation where the last card is not by itself, okay? And then I, I observe the following, guys. If the last card is not by itself, then if I remove that last card, I still have K piles, do you agree? K piles, but fewer objects, good? So, uh, so this is what I observe. So if I can figure out how many uh, partitions, how many ways to distribute the uh, n minus one objects into k piles, then I, I can place my last card to either pile one or pile two or pile three or pile four or all the way to pile k. And I can, and, and, so, you, and so it's not confusing. How do I know what is pile one, pile two, pile two, three, et cetera. I can create a sort of dictionary order. Maybe pile one is the pile containing the smallest uh, card. Okay, and pile two is the pile containing uh, uh, the next smallest card not in, this, uh, not in that pile, you understand? I can number them even without considering uh, the order in which they are displayed. So there is no contradiction in how I'm doing it. Make sense? You have to think very clearly because otherwise you start thinking, can I count, how do I know what is one, two, three? Is the procedure clear? So I'm claiming that the answer is, is uh, this formula, right? The K here, it's for uh, the places where I can place uh, the last uh, card, right? In the, 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 the four possibilities to place it so it's not alone, right? And here is how this procedure works if I have only few objects, okay? So let's calculate uh, how many ways to distribute uh, four objects among three piles. I just selected small numbers so that you can easily uh, see how that would work, okay? So here is the situation. So then according to my formula, consider the situation in which, in which the fourth card is alone. The fourth card is alone. Here it is, look at it. Uh, the fourth card is alone means that uh, we have only uh, two additional piles where maybe one and two are together, three is alone, or one and three together, two is alone, or one is alone and two and three together, yes? And uh, four is alone here. So uh, what is this? This number is how many ways to distribute three into two piles. As you can see, the number is, I can just, by, by just playing with it, I can obviously see the answer is three. 
right? If I have three objects and to partition it into two piles, the answer is three, okay? So this is three. Now, what's the situation when, uh, when uh, the fourth number is not by itself? If it's not by itself, it means I, I already must have three piles. Do you agree? I must have three piles. And if I have three piles uh, made of the other objects, they, then one pile contains the object one, the other the object two, the other the object three. And uh, four is either in first or second or third pile. So there are three possibilities. So there is n three of three is one, and I need to multiply it by three, okay? And here is my Kafka document for, uh, for recording the information, right? So this is for the situation where uh, N is not alone. So here I imagine uh, giving a code to each distribution of the previous piles. I don't know what it will be, but I can definitely give it a code uh, for each distribution. And here I will say uh, to which file does N belong based on that code. And that will be a Kafka protocol for it. Good. And here we have uh, the, the calculation carried through. With 52, the answer is simply N4 uh, of 52. And how to solve it, maybe, maybe you can come up with a better solution or maybe it's, it's not really viable with integers. You understand? So I am convinced naturally that my formula works. I thought about it. Uh, and, um, but it's a recursive, uh, it's a recursive solution. I cannot uh, give a closed formula. I cannot say multiply, divide, add. I do not know how to do this, but if you can come up with a way to do that, that's amazing. Here is a next, next question, guys. 52 cards are dipped in black ink, so they are made indistinguishable. They're all the same. Now, how many ways of dividing them into four equal piles? What do you say now? We're just playing with all the ideas that we learned up to this point. Exactly, Andre. And exactly, Aaron, right? There is only one way to do that because it doesn't matter. Just a lot a 13 to person one, a lot the next 13 to person number two. There is completely no need to do any distributions of any sort, right? They are the same. Nobody cares. Okay, and here is that solution. So there's only one way. Next is 52 black cards, not distinguishable, are to be divided into four, possibly an unequal piles among four players. You understand? So by that, I mean, naturally in this, in this context, it seems that every person should get something, right? Let's, let's interpret this as meaning, if it's to be divided among four people, let's interpret it for a moment to mean each person is supposed to get something. Actually, give me both solutions. Uh, give me the solution where, uh, where, where you don't have to give each person something and the solution where you do have to give each person at least one item.
All right, Sarah. Um, yes, I got a question. So, Go ahead. so with this question, right, you're taking you're taking 52 cars, right? With those 52 cars, you you the you um getting um oh, I forgot the exclamation point um the um factorial. the the factorial of that, right? So it's, it should be 52 C uh with the factorial of of four, right? And then you're getting a whole nother four players, right? So wouldn't you add another um no, you are not adding I'm sorry for the background. But um shouldn't you um I'm not sure. I'm not one hundred percent sure. No worries, right? Sure. So uh, that's probability. Nobody is one hundred percent sure. It's always between zero and one, the certainty. Right? So we will I'll show you in a moment. I'll show you in a moment how we solve it, but uh, guys, I, I don't see the solutions jumping at me. Right? Why are the solutions not jumping at me? Or are they? No, they're not. Lack of oxygen where you are? No, no, not four to the power of fifty-two Abdel. Jennifer, thank you. Interesting. All right, one more minute, guys. Come on, you can do it. It's very easy. Not very easy, but if you understood that idea, then uh, it's quick. You understand? Imagine that those 52 cards are now like uh, single dollars. So you don't care if you get one George Washington uh, as opposed to another George Washington, correct? So you have 52 George Washingtons. How many ways to distribute those among four individuals? where the distribution does not have to be equal. No, that's the thing. We don't use formulas, my friends. We do not use formulas. What do we use? We use protocols. Right, guys, you're not following this. Right? If you're gonna think in terms of what formula to use, you're, you are in this uh, cooking type of uh, uh, mentality, right? You're not putting some sugar, some salt, you know, that's not how it works, no. You have to come up with a code, you have to understand how it works, and boom, you have the solution. Uh, okay, so uh, FNU says uh, only one way. All right, guys, so let, again, we, we see that uh, something here is not uh, uh, fully right. So what protocol are we using? Exactly, well, what was I was explaining today? That same protocol we can use. So here's the situation, guys. We have 52 cards. Right, so imagine that those cards are, well, I'm gonna represent them uh, as zeros, just like, because it reminds us of the toilet paper problem, right? The 52 cards, it's also kind of very, very good analogy, right? Because money uh, in today's time, uh, with everything that's happening is becoming like toilet paper. So you should understand this analogy perfectly, right? So we have uh, 52 cards. Right, so this is uh, uh, one, uh, two, three, fifty-two. They are not specifically very different. I just numbered them so that you see there are fifty-two. I don't want to draw fifty-two circles. Right, those are my cards, my Washingtons, my whatever. Good. I have four individuals that I have to give it to. Do you agree? Four individuals. So, if I am not forced to give, uh, so one, one part is uh, you are not forced to give something to, some, uh, to, uh, to everyone. Not everyone gets, not everyone has to get something. Good, not everyone has to get something. Guys, so what do we have? If we have those items and we have how many shoppers? We have four shoppers, yes? So how do we divide what one shopper gets as opposed to what another shopper gets? You haven't been to the store lately, right? What do you use? 
you use a partition bar. How many partition bars do I need? How many? Three. Three partition bars, yes? Very good, three partition bars. So I have uh, a partition bar one, partition bar two, partition bar three. Do you understand why three? Yes? And now any uh, barcode, how many, how many digits are going to be in my barcode? My protocol is to use a barcode here. That was uh, the way I thought of it. Why three, Thelma? Because one bar divides uh, uh, the items of one shopper and those of the other shopper. If you have two bars, look at it, can you see it? Well, before this bar, you have shopper one, between those two, you have shopper two, and after this one, you have shopper three. So if you have two bars, you have three shoppers, right? And if you have three bars, you have four shoppers. Does it now make sense? You see what happened here? We just came up with, a, with an idea and we're using it, wonderful. Now tell me how many digits are in my barcode? How many digits in my barcode? Uh, 55, uh, what is it? 52 plus three is 55, thank you. I, I'm by the way, terrible at adding, right? So uh, is that when, when I calculate uh, tip, I would pretty much just say let X plus, you know, I just, I come up with a formula and let them solve it. So what you have here is 52 plus, Three. Do you understand what are the, those things? That, that's the length of my, that's the number of spaces for my digits. Yes? Now out of those digits, guys, what do I select? What do I choose? Choose, no, Andre, not four, three. Do you see why you choose three? What are the three chosen? What you do when you choose three, that's one solution. What you say is, uh, what is this three guys? Choose three of the spaces. You see there are 52 plus three or 55 spaces. Choose three of those spaces to be occupied by the bars. Because as soon as I know which spaces are occupied by the bars, I know everything about the situation. Yes? Do you understand guys? So it's 52 choose three. Or equally, I can do this. I can write it as 52 plus three, choose 52. Here I decide where the zeros go. Yes, zeros represent toilet paper, ones represent the bars. Good. So you understand that and, and how do you calculate it? The calculation is uh, in terms of factorials, right? Just, that's, that's, the, that's already, we learned how to do this protocol, guys. If you're stuck on that, we can go over that again. But uh, you see, once we know how to do one of the calculations, we don't always have to go back to it. But you always, always uh, think about it carefully because you see, guys, this question is supposed to be easy, right? You always think about it. And can you justify how combinations work? Because maybe you forget. So this is simply, uh, simply I would write it as uh, 55 factorial divided by three factorial and uh, 52 factorial. Now, why this formula is true? That's combinations, good? That's one way to do that. that that's when uh, not, it allows for the possibility of some of the people not getting any cards, yes? Some people are not getting any cards. Next. Next, uh, I want you to think about the situation. What happens now when everyone is supposed to get something? You can, you can do it directly. You can do it indirectly and you can do it directly. Let's do it directly, okay? Uh, everyone is supposed to get at least one item. Okay, so be careful, Jennifer, because uh, it's a, now a, a slightly different uh, question, right? So uh, you need to think about it carefully. Everyone is supposed to get 
at least an item. All right, so the previous situation allows for one to be next to one. And if one is next to one, then somebody did not get something. You agree? If in my barcode I see one, one, a sequence of ones, that means at least one person did not get something. Here, I'm not allowed to have consecutive ones. Okay. You can do it uh, like, uh, like Aaron did, right? You first take 52, subtract uh, four cards and give it to the people and then uh, do the previous situation, yes? But uh, you can do it uh, also directly, right? So, we'll, we'll, so basically we, we already figured the previous uh, equation. We can assign before we do anything, assign one, 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 one. And then we have 52 minus four that needs to be distributed like they were before. And we don't need to do anything else, yes? You understood guys uh, uh, how Aaron suggested to solve it? Aaron says that now we have uh, 52 minus four plus three, choose uh, three. Clear why? The minus four is because uh, I give each individual a card. So I have now 52 minus four remaining items to be divided. And those items I now am free to divide without giving them at all to the shoppers, right? So that is absolutely right. Another way to see this answer is uh, to do the following. You see, you can uh, imagine the items uh, are, so the items are one, two, three, all the way to 52. And between them, there is the spaces. Right, and again, why we do that, again, we were trying to learn of many ways of trying to uh, pay attention to something, good. So uh, how many spaces do we have now? Look at it, so we have space one, space two, space 51, one less than the number of items, right? So once I specify a space, that, uh, that, that tells me where to place the bar. So you see, I, I, I cannot place the bars next to each other this way, right? Because I cannot place two of them here, good. So once I uh, select a place, how many places do I need to select? So I have uh, 51, choose three. And you can see that those give me the same exact uh, solution, right? Notice guys, very important here. Uh, not the algebraically, obviously this is the same thing, but we are, we are noticing we did a different combinatorial uh, process. You understand? We are not just uh, looking at algebra, we're looking at the combinatorial process. That's somehow more important. Okay, so when you, you present the solution differently, you are doing a different combinatorial process. And on the exam, that's why it's good to practice that. I would ask you to tell me what's your combinatorial process. You understand? I don't want your just answer. I want to see the document. How did you encode the information? Good. And it's nice to do the problem in different ways because if you have two different processes and they give you the same result, you are much more convinced that you are correct. All right, let's continue. When is this, this class is over at 6.50, correct? Yes. Okay, here is the next uh, question, guys. This one reminds me of something that, uh, well, uh, let's, before I say what it reminds me of, let's think uh, if you can solve it, okay, guys? So 10 children come to a party. Three of them are very good friends and will only sit together. How many ways of sitting them in a row? That's the easy part, yes? But I want you to not just do it by counting possibilities. I want you to think about a process. You understand?
Okay, let's see what we are getting there. Okay. Okay, and interesting. And again, guys, we uh, enjoy the process. You see, not only the solution, that's no, we want to enjoy the process. What is the idea that uh, you have there? He is allowed to go since he is not registered, okay? All right. So some of you have answered, let's look at the question together. Okay, so here is my uh, Kafka protocol. Good. So the friends that uh, will not be separated will be formed into a human centipede, right? At least in terms of the code, because this way, uh, uh, you know, they are be treated as one object. So my Kafka protocol will regard the three friends, A, B, C, as one individual and the remaining individuals are separate. So altogether there are three, uh, and then you have uh, individuals two all the way to individuals eight. Make sense? Now in my protocol, I uh, have those boxes, you see? So first box represents the arrangement in which I attach those friends together. You see, because I can make it ABC or BAC or any other combination. You see, so this it refers to how exactly I form my individual. There are three factorial ways of doing that. And this box is how I then place them among each other, right? So this is individual one. So this category ABC is where I see individual one, right? So it's three factorial times eight factorial. And let's see who had it right. So Aaron Wright, Andre Wright, Ben Wright. Um, okay, let me see. And Sarah, yes, good, very good. Now comes the harder question. Are you ready for it? Now you want to place them on a merry-go-round. How many possibilities now? That was for linear ordering. So it was three factorial multiplied by eight factorial. And if you wrote eight factorial multiplied by three factorial, you might have had a different document. Similar result, correct, but a different document. Good. Professor, I have a quick question. Go ahead. So for this one, I mean, the question A, there were, you're grouping the three people together and I get that. And there's seven people left. And that yeah. combination is eight factorial. Uh, and the combination is the one uh, three person person, right? Uh, this is the human centipede of uh, three together with the remaining ones. It's uh, eight individuals, right? Because, uh, because, okay. uh, because it, basically individuals, uh, let's say they were numbered initially, uh, uh, you know, they were, they were numbered uh, uh, one, two, three. Now one, two, three becomes just one, right? We had all together 10 individuals. So, uh, uh, so we had remaining seven. So one plus seven is eight. We have eight objects now. And those eight okay. objects can be placed in each order. But the way I, uh, there is also the accounting in, in a row, how do I uh, bring together the three individuals? How are they sitting in a row together, right? So my first box uh, tells, uh, tells me how to construct the individual. 
the eighth individual, if you like, or the first individual, doesn't matter, right? And then the remaining ones uh, are just how to arrange them. You understand? And how do I know I'm correct? How do you see, why do I do those boxes? That tells me exactly when to multiply. Do you see that? Uh, it tells me multiply this by that. That's what it's supposed to do, right? And, uh, and, and how do I know? I'm just counting the codes. Is this uh, form, is this uh, coding going to identify a unique situation? The answer is obviously yes, right? I know here how the individuals were made and where they are placed. So that means this code tells me exactly what happened. You understand? If a code, if, if you read the code then you know exactly what happened and there are no other codes that say the same thing, and then you just count the number of codes and you're done. Good? So it's absolutely uh, three factorial times eight factorial, no other way. <clears throat> now, uh, your goal, guys, is to try to place them on a merry-go-round, please. Be careful, guys, uh, uh, with uh, the merry-go-round. First of all, understand what's the difference between merry-go-round and uh, the situation. Okay, maybe you're right. All right, so... Uh, no, I didn't say uh, uh, that you are wrong. I just uh, mentioned be careful, right? Okay, we have a lot of your answers, so let's consider it together, okay, guys? So you might have solved it um, in, in the, for particular questions, there are sometimes fast ways of doing that, but here is uh, what we observe, guys. So for B, first of all, the idea, what is a merry-go-round, right? Look at this thing, guys. Here is a linear arrangement. You take a piece of paper, a sheet, and the linear arrangement is A, B, C, D you know where the beginning and where the end is. Yes, so that's linear ordering. I can only read this word as A, B, C, D. Now imagine what I do is I glue this into a cylinder. So a merry-go-round, I make it go around the circle. I glue it in the cylinder, right? And I fuse this bar. So now the word A, B, C, D is the same as the word B, C, just you read it as the same thing, the same pattern will be read as B, C, D, A, or C, D, A, B, or D, A, B, C. Do you understand? And uh, how do I decide to read it? I always read in this case uh, uh, counterclockwise. In other words, I read around, I read like this, right? So if I, and, and, and the reason I can do it, um, I can read different words is because I am now free to choose where to start. Do you see that? I can choose where to start. I can start with A or I can start with B. So if I start with A, it's A, B, C, D. If I start with B, it's B, C, D, A. If I start with C, it's C, D, A, B. Do you understand? The difference between uh, linear ordering in a, in a cylinder is that in a cylinder, you are free to start anywhere you like. Right? The, it's a circle. You can decide where is beginning and where is end, whereas in a linear order, it's defined for you. Good? So, here is then uh, the situation. If it's in a cylinder, I can imagine that I am uh, I am a reader. You know, reader is let's say like I imagine a player and it's spinning, and then I I wait for my mark to start reading the letter. Okay, so I am told here to start reading once uh, I hit uh, the the first group. So this is my first group. You see, the red is my first group. Once I see the first individual. Uh, once it spins, when I see the first individual, then I have to read three of them, right? Once I see the first individual, I begin reading it. You follow? So Andre, of course, you were right in your solution and other people that wrote three factorial times seven factorial are correct. Why are you correct? The easiest way to see it, in, or the, the, not the easiest necessarily, but, the, uh, but it's a sure way to see it. 
you see what happens guys is that this i can i can feel this previous form and i can write here one because i can uh, guarantee that the sequence begins with one there is no starting point so i might as well make it one as a starting point you understand so this place is filled with the letter one and then i have uh, seven remaining items so it's three factorial times seven factorial did you get how i reasoned it out guys is that there is no beginning and there is no end until you decide, or better said, you decide in a circle where it is here. There is a dashed line, but the dashed line just means that I decided A to be the beginning and D to be the end. I could have made the dashed line anywhere else. I can take a cylinder and I can cut it and make it a flat sheet, but I can make the cut anywhere I like. That's the difference, do you understand? And so when the merry-go-round spins, you can imagine uh, uh, you, 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 you are, the, you, if you have a, say a scanner, the scanner is triggered once uh, the part a particular number is going through. So once I see the number one, the reader is triggered and it begins to read the word. And once, the, once it sees the number again, it stops reading it, okay? So if I just have, let's say, eight individuals, forget about the, uh, the three people together for a moment, if I just have eight individuals, right? I can uh, start reading it once I see individual one, and then stop reading it once I see individual one again. You agree? In a row, it matters who is first or second. In a merry-go-round, no. So I, I say start when I see individual one and end once I see individual one again. So I can imagine it's linear ordering, but it's starting with the number one. Good? And so I use that idea. You understand me, guys? It's easy but it's visual and I'm, I'm hoping you can see it as I explained. You're with me? Okay, uh, if you are, you will help me with this problem, okay guys? So I wanted to generalize it because, um, uh, so here we have the situation, we have n children in total. If you want, I, I can give you numbers, but this is just a, a formula that we are trying to derive. n children in total, Let's say if you want to have, uh, well, let's, let's say if you can do it, uh, do it directly, okay? You can type it out still. Uh, we, uh, we have, and one of them are from summer camp one and two from summer camp two, all the way to NK from summer camp K. Let's say they're wearing different shorts, so you can distinguish them, right? You can see one is green short, one is red short, you know, you can really tell apart who is from which camp. And of course, the total number of individuals is N. People from the same camp must stay together. How many ways are there to sit them to watch a movie if you're sitting them in a row? So there is one row uh, and you're sitting them all and the same camp must stay together. You cannot have a mixture between camps. Uh, so we Sarah uh, we are doing it for for a uh, for um, for placing them in in a row right and then you can think about well how to do it for b Okay, thank you, Sarah. That's right. Do you see that? Uh, do you see it, guys? Uh, so if you if you're reading it, right? So uh, uh, so Sarah answered both A and B actually. So I'm hoping everyone here understands how that works. Yes. So here is my protocol, all right? So I have individuals arranged for camp one, camp two, all the way uh, to camp uh, K. So this is just how I build them up, right? So here they are N1 factorial and two factorial all the way to NK factorial. And here I place those camps in order. So first I sit to my left, camp one, then camp two, then onward. So they are K factorial, right? So the answer is 
as Sarah suggested, I just placed the ordering of the camps uh, last. So it's this. But uh, Sarah placed this box first. So she has a slightly uh, cosmetically different document. Good. You understand, guys, how I feel those boxes? And uh, if I feel it correctly, I know uh, I have I read this code, I see what happens. So it's this number. Now, if we are uh, on a merry-go-round, the last number is uh, k minus one because I can always ensure that the first uh, uh, the first camp I observe on the merry-go-round is camp number one. You see, I look at the sequence as as the merry-go-round rolls. I see, I see, I'm, I'm going to pay attention until I see first camp. And then let's say merry-go-round goes counterclockwise. So I see first camp. What follows first camp is no longer determined. But uh, I always see first camp number one. Clear? So do you see why it's k minus one factorial? Wonderful. So we're doing pretty well, I think. Uh, and here is, um, it's a true problem that I have. Four computer science, five math, and 10 sociology majors are taking a six hour probability exam. It's completely fake, guys, because my exams will not uh, take six hours. They will take six days. Good. So they are taking six hour exam. And uh, I cannot tell students they look all the same to me, except those that study in different category. I can tell sociology students apart from, uh, uh, from math students and apart from computer science students. They look like they are wearing different shirts. Good. And uh, in how many ways can I see them if all I record is who left uh, the exam after first hour or within the first hour? or within the second hour, or within the third hour, or within the fourth hour, you understand? So I make a note, only uh, let's say uh, I just have first hour and I list uh, labeling, right? So let's say sociology, math, or whatnot, right? For first hour. And then for second hour, I do the same and all the way to the sixth hour. My question is uh, how many patterns can I see and how many ways can those people leave the classroom in the way that I will observe? <laughs> no, actually, what they usually do is much more practical. They just uh, send it to check and try to cheat this way and think that uh, I would not uh, realize that. Partition? Well, I mean, you, you heard this question. I mean, I'm not sure what's required. They just, here is a question. How do you solve it? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying, guys, right? So I can only notice uh, which category left at which particular hour, and not all of them. So I can see how many individuals from a category left in each particular hour. That's all I notice. But I cannot tell which individual left. Yes, I partitioned by hours, I presume. Oh, beautiful. We already have a solution. Wonderful. Let's uh, see what it is, guys. Are you ready? Uh, 
Uh, be careful, guys. So, so here is let's let's see how uh, we go about it. Anybody before I show it, anybody still wants to think about it, or you would like to see the solution? One person uh, answered it. Do you want to see it, or um, or you want to think a little longer? Oh, Andre, nice. Okay, so nobody stops me, then I'm going uh, on with the solution. Here we go, guys. Okay, so uh, people look to me like pawns, but some of them look like pawns wearing red shorts, some look like pawns wearing blue shorts, and others uh, look like pawns wearing some other short. I, I suppose sociology majors are not dignified with a short. So, even though actually my best probability student uh, one semester was actually from sociology, but he looked like he's from a sociologist from Mars. So, <clears throat> so what we have is uh, we have the customers in my shop are now the hours, right? So uh, the hour one, hour two, hour six, all the way, right? So I will see three equations, right? Um, which hour claims uh, the uh, the particular identical computer science majors, which hour will claim the particular math majors and exactly, right? And which, but uh, we, it, we will multiply them all, right? And which will claim the sociology majors. So uh, you see, I have those three boxes and simply it's nine choose five, 10 choose five, uh, 15 choose five. You understand? I just solve that partition problem three times and I multiply it, right? Do you see why I multiply? Because in my uh, protocol, I see three codes. I see uh, the codes for uh, for how the math majors left, the codes for how the computer science major left, and for the sociology majors. I see three codes of zeros and ones, three barcodes, right? And I consider how many ways to create one barcode, the next barcode, and the third barcode. That's why I multiply. Do you understand? It's not arbitrary why I multiply. You have to imagine the code. Good? Wonderful. So, uh, we are, oh, it's, it's pretty impressive, right? We uh, finished uh, this lecture. We have another, um, what, six minutes to go or so. So let's see if we can continue with uh, the review. So I think we stopped with problem number two. So let's see if you can solve guys problem number three. A taxi driver in Manhattan must navigate a four by five city grid starting from zero zero and ending in four five. Um, the driver must also pick up an additional passenger located at point two two. How many ways are there to get to the final destination if bo going back isn't allowed? And then I quoted uh, one of my favorite poem to explain why going back isn't allowed, right? По несчастью или к счастью истина проста. Никогда не возвращайся в прежние места. If anybody speaks Russian, you understand what I said. Good. Uh, you can make the problem slightly simpler for yourself by just thinking uh, of the taxi driver needing to go from zero, zero to four, five for a moment. Don't bother about the passenger. Let's see if you can solve it without the passenger. Okay, understood guys? Simplify it just to go from zero, zero position on the grid to four, five position on the grid. And you're only allowed to move to the right and up. You never are allowed to move left or down. Make sense?
uh, you can only only decide to move right or up. You understand? That's the only possibility. You have to make it to uh, four or five, only moving right and up. You cannot move down or left. Understood? <coughs> These are review problems for, I believe for maybe, maybe more than that, but exam one is, uh, is heavily emphasized. We have so many questions for exam one. It's, it's really the basis of whatever we will do. We will begin a review of Calc 2. We will spend at most one lecture on that. And then we go into chapter two. Or not just Calc 2, but we will review, I think the ideas that we might need for this class in case you don't remember them well. Uh, so, okay, Sabrina. <clears throat> Um, I think some, some different number than 60 I'm getting. Of course, maybe you're solving the actual problem three. I asked to solve uh, a reduced problem, right? Where you are just moving, uh, forget about the passenger for the moment. You're just moving to point uh, four five. Okay, passenger, we will take care of him later. All right, guys, so the official class time is over, but I will stay here and uh, answer this question. If you decide you want to leave, uh, it's up to you. And uh, if you stay for office hours, we, will, we can solve or address some of your problems, maybe problems from the book or anything that was particularly troublesome to you. Okay, Nora, that's, uh, uh, that's very good, Nora. Sabrina, that's very good. Very good, amazing, right? Amazing, we're getting it. All right, are you ready guys or you want to think longer? Okay, Andre, nice, very nice. All right, let me show you how to solve it, yes? One second, somebody wants something there? Okay. Let me show you how to solve this problem. Then you can uh, try to figure the uh, problem asked, right? So in the grid, guys, what do you have? You have uh, one movement uh, uh, to the right, two movements to the right, three movements to the right, uh, four movements to the right that you need to make in order to get to uh, your uh, location, yes? Maybe I will even draw the grid one second. Let me do it this way, okay? So the grid, um, yeah. 
and uh, yeah that's my grid so we have uh, we need to execute one two three four five movements uh, up and one two three four movements to the right notice that uh, my path is specified that each at each place i choose to move right or, or move up good so one possibility for me to get to this particular corner is to first move uh, right 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 and then uh, up 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 and up okay so that's a particular pathway that represents uh, moving like this okay any other uh, re rearrangement of rights and ups will represent a different pathway do you agree because each pathway can describe how did you go there did you go up right up right what did you do but you will have to execute exactly four movements to the right and exactly five movement, movements up so what you can all together you execute a total of nine movements five plus four is nine nine movements in total and uh, out of those movements let's say first second third all the way to the ninth movement you choose the four movements uh that um, the, the four movements that were right the remaining are movements up so it's nine choose four or equally nine choose five obviously right you can choose the up movements or the right movement do you understand the idea you all see that guys because uh, my code is now rights and uh, right and up a bunch of r's and u's they are going my code consists of exactly um of exactly four r's and exactly five u's and i just have to decide which uh, where do i do the u's where do i do the r's good well, that was amazing, guys. I'm glad you understand it. Uh, so if you have questions for me, then stay for office hours. I'm stopping the recording.